Can you explain us what are psychedelics and how do they change the way how our brain works? Well, the scientific definition that I always cite was in a um, pharmacology textbook called The Pharmacological Basis of Therapeutics. A Goodman and Gilman is what people call it. It's sort of the Bible for pharmacologists. And in the seventh and eighth editions, the definition of psychedelic was that these are compounds that produce changes in thought, mood, and perception that normally would only occur when you're dreaming or when you're having a religious experience. And that's a very strange definition for a drug class. You know, it produces effects like dreaming and, and religious experience. So that's what they do. Basically, uh, we know they affect a type of brain serotonin receptor. In fact, the serotonin 2A receptor evolutionarily is very ancient. Uh, 5-HT2 receptors occur in single-celled organisms. So it's, um, it's something that nature has found and it's worked. And so when things work, nature preserves them through evolution. So we have those same kinds of receptors in our brain. And they're in a part of the brain that's critical for our perception and cognition. The cortex, the outer part of the brain, um, that's the most recent evolutionary development. And it's what makes us different from other animals, is the fact the development of our cortex, our ability to imagine and appreciate things, and uh, it really the responsible for our culture. So the main neurons in your cortex that are responsible for that kind of function, higher, what would be called higher executive function, um, they are called cortical pyramidal neurons. They're in layer five of the cortex. And the serotonin 2A receptors are targets for the psychedelics. When a psychedelic binds to one of those receptors, it activates the receptor. And that changes, and the receptor is, a, is expressed in the membrane of the neuron. And when you activate those, it changes the membrane potential of those neurons. It makes them easier to fire. So what they will pick up is weaker signals than normal. Normally, um, if we're just conscious and, and we're walking down the street or whatever, um, we're basically paying attention to things that protect our survival. We're watching out for cars or we're thinking about what we have to do in the next job or whatever. But when you take a psychedelic, all kinds of information comes flooding in. Irrelevant information in terms of our survival because now these uh, pyramidal cells can essentially compute more information, pick up more information than they normally would. So by changing the electrical potential of these cells in the cortex, you really change the function of the way the brain works. And I've likened it to a computer that's a massively parallel processor computer where you have things running in parallel at the same time. The brain is like a massively parallel biocomputer. And you can imagine all the processes that are going on as I speak to you or you hear things or you notice the light is brighter here or darker here, or anything, everything you pick up, um, all that is coming in into your brain at the same time. And if you change the way your brain processes by changing the membrane potential of these neurons, your perception is different. And that's basically what happens as to why it produces effects like dreams or uh, religious experiences, no one has made that connection. But it fundamentally changes the way our brain processes incoming information. There are so many receptors in the brain. Why is it exactly the serotonin 2A receptors that is associated with this mind-blowing effects on our brain? There are a lot of different receptors in the brain, um, you know, dopamine and norepinephrine receptors and 14 different kinds of serotonin receptors, etc. I think it may be more related to um, an evolutionary process. I mean, you could say, why do humans have these big marvelous brains? You know, what, why, why, did, why did that ever happen? And it has something to do with our survival, our ability to adapt. So as during evolution, as uh, say the environment changed or ice ages came and went and all, humans to survive had to adapt to those changes and learn how to you know, survive in cold environments or hot environments. So you needed the brain really as a tool for survival. The, you can think of the body as just a support system for the brain really, I think. And so um, it's of fundamental importance for our survival, for everything we do, it's all focused on the brain. We are really essentially our brains. So that receptor somehow, nature found it early on, as I said, in single-celled organisms. And so it's one of, one of the most widely expressed receptors in the human body or throughout the animal kingdom. 
So nature has decided it's important. We're going to keep that in. We're going to keep it, and it's going to become an important part of brain architecture. Um, why that one? And nature decided, whatever nature is. Um, it must have given survival advantages to those early organisms for some reason. And so it's been carried on into higher you know, mammalians and to humans. But um, it's one among many types of receptors, but uh, for some reason nature's decided that has to be a very important one for our, our cognition. According to the stoned ape theory, the use of psychedelics contributed to us becoming human. Do you agree with this theory? Yeah, I don't subscribe to the stoned ape theory. Um, evolution doesn't really work that way. You would have to imagine some ancient culture that wasn't very cognitively aware, um, eating mushrooms all the time, and then for some people having a perception that they got on mushrooms, for those people being better able to survive and propagate. Um, mushrooms don't, I mean, they just don't in influence, in my opinion, changes, genetic changes. Uh, you really you really need something more than that. I mean, it's it's a cute theory. I guess Terence McKenna was one of his favorite theories, and Dennis McKenna has kind of subscribed to it. But I don't believe evolution occurs that way. As a scientist, what is it that you found so fascinating with uh, psychedelic substances? How What, what brought you into this uh, field of science? So I've been asked that before, and what I, I, an answer I told a woman years ago, which is an answer that I like, uh, and maybe this will resonate. I said, think of the things that change your life. Um, you fall in love, you maybe get married, you have a child, uh, maybe a child or sibling dies, or you take a dose of LSD, and then everybody stops. You took a dose of So think about it. A minuscule, tiny amount of this compound can go into your brain stay there for a couple of hours, leave the brain again, and for many people, they never see this, the world in the same way again, for better, for worse. I said, how is it possible that a molecule can do that? What part of the brain does that molecule hit that can cause something so powerful to happen? So it surprises me that more people don't study psychedelics because they, they really, they, they force you to ask the question, what does it mean to be a human? What is consciousness? You know, the very important question. So to me, I mean, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer, so to speak, to, to study psychedelics. Do you consider ketamine a psychedelic? Uh, ketamine's an anesthetic, really. At low doses, it can it produce a dissociative effect. I have never had any experience with uh, ketamine. I know people who have, and they say, yeah, it's interesting. But if they've never had a psychedelic, it's interesting. But then if they have a psychedelic, say, well, it's really pretty different from something like psilocybin or LSD. I don't consider it a psychedelic in the terms of, if you look at Osman's, Humphrey Osman's definition of mind expanding, it's kind of more of a deliriant, I think, an anesthetic deliriant. So I don't consider it a psychedelic. There are people that do. And a lot of that argument is driven by the fact that ketamine is, is legal. Physicians have been able to use it as an, an anesthetic and so they can get it. Whereas the, the, the serotonergic psychedelics like LSD, mescaline, DMT, they're illegal, so there hasn't been any research for 50 years. So ketamine, well, if you're interested in something new, ketamine will fix people who have depression very quickly, but it only lasts for a week or two. Whereas psilocybin, we know now, can last for a year or more. So it's a different mechanism. They may have some common things that they do. Ketamine involves uh, increased levels of glutamate in the brain. That's an excitatory transmitter. And we know that serotonergic psychedelics also increase brain levels of glutamate. So there may be some commonality, but I don't really consider ketamine to be a psychedelic. Why is it that psychedelics are not addictive and uh, people who use psychedelics develop tolerance so fast? Yeah, so um, psychedelics, when they activate the 2A receptor, one of the signaling components that's activated is called beta arrestin. And beta arrestin leads to the internalization of receptors. So it's as if the body is saying, this receptor is being stimulated too much, let's pull it away from the cell surface so it can't be stimulated anymore. And that's kind of what happens. So the, when the receptor is activated, it recruits this signaling molecule called beta arrestin, and beta arrestin internalizes the receptor so it can't be activated anymore. That happens very quickly. 
And maybe um, because this receptor is so important, the body doesn't want it overactivated because it, it would be inimical to your survival. If you were taking the psychedelic all the time in a hunter-gatherer society, you wouldn't survive because everything would be distorted and unreal. So it's probably the fact that it's such an important receptor, the body has got kind of a built-in safeguard to pull it away from the, from the neuronal surface so that it doesn't keep being stimulated. And it happens, you know, very quickly. It's called tachyphylaxis. Within three or four days, if you take LSD, the same dose every day, by the fourth day, almost nothing happens. That's different from um, things like uh, opioids, heroin or morphine. They activate opioid receptors and you build up tolerance. So what happens, the opioid receptor becomes less sensitive, so more receptors are produced. And so it takes more of the opioid. And so then it takes more and more and more. So that's called the typical tolerance with a, an opioid. And it's a very different kind of tolerance than you see with the psychedelics. You synthesized several uh, substances, new uh, psychedelic substances. Can you highlight a few examples from your research? <laughs> well. Um, I wouldn't say I've hit a home, any home runs. They've all been incremental studies, and much like Sasha Shogun, where we've made lots and lots of molecules, and that's allowed us to understand what the structural features are of drugs that activate those receptors. Um, you know, I've looked at phenethylamines. We've mapped out how the phenethylamines, what shape they have when they bind to the receptor. Originally, I was trying to understand how phenethylamines like mescaline and LSD, which is a different, completely different structure, how they could activate the same receptor. So I was making analogs of phenethylamines, and I was trying to make them look a bit like a, a hybrid between, say, mescaline and LSD, and seeing at what point did we see act activity that was the same. It turns out there's just no similarity. They're both, um, they're all basic, they all have a basic nitrogen, essentially two carbons away from an aromatic system. And that's what the receptor is looking for. So I start off just doing chemistry and then got into some animal behavior, then into biochemistry and then molecular biology. We started, as the field progressed, we tried to track, you know, with the receptor. We made mutations in the receptor to try to understand how these drugs were binding. And now we have crystal structures. So the thing, the field has really advanced very rapidly. And a lot of the work that I did can be explained by what we know about how these things bind. In my talk this morning, I talked about how mescaline binds. We never knew why the middle methoxy of mescaline, if you extended it from methyl to ethyl to other things, the potency increased. We never understood why that was. Now we have a crystal structure showing mescaline in that receptor and we see there is a big space where that substituent, the four position, can push in there and interact with the amino acid residues that are there. So it was really uh, not a question of really any one thing it was creating a database of compounds that we could use. Many of the compounds, you know, we made thing intactogens related to MDMA that uh, had a different structure. Um, we made compounds related to mescaline that were much more potent. Uh, we, we explored, there were N-benzyl compounds, n bone compounds. We explored why they were so active. We know why that is now. So it's really just putting together a database of information about the receptor and how it works and what's it looking for. Do you think that any of these new psychedelic substances can have a bigger therapeutic potential than the traditional psychedelics? Um, that's probably an open question. Uh, we haven't been in this field for very long. You know, for 50 years, the government regulations kept any work from being done. And now we see there's this explosion of literature and research and so uh, probably some fallout from that will be somebody will discover something that's maybe better than anything we've seen before or has more potential. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but you can't do this. You can't have so many people working in an area doing so many different things before somebody stumbles on something or maybe even designs something that's maybe better than anything we've got now. For right now, everything is either a natural substance or it's a derivative. So you have psilocybin, but you can modify psilocybin by changing from a dimethyl to a diethyl to methyl isopropyl, and you can move the oxygen to the four position and to the five position, and you can do things like that. They're just variations of a theme. Something that's truly novel, a new chemotype, a new molecule, hasn't, I haven't seen it yet at least, but I expect that somebody will find something like that, given all the intensity of effort that's in this field now. 
there is much hype around psychedelics right now. And do you think there is a risk that this will backfire and there will be disappointments later? Um, it's certainly true there's a lot of hype. People are looking at psychedelics as, as sort of the philosopher's stone. They can do everything. You know, we, know, we know they can be used to treat depression and anxiety and alcohol use disorder and nicotine addiction. And there's studies looking at eating disorders and studies that obs looking at obsessive compulsive disorder. And I don't know how many of those will actually be validated in large trials. But given the, the importance of really the brain, and the fact that these hit a centrally important receptor in the brain, it doesn't surprise me that it would have a lot of, these would have a lot of different uses. Uh, we'll just have to see with time, you know, the studies are small. To market a drug for a major pharmaceutical company, you need a, a phase three trial that has 300, 400, 500 patients. And we haven't seen studies like that. I, I think we'll, there's a lot of dust right now. But the hype is a lot of noise and, you know, chaos. I think it'll settle down and there'll be a there'll be a few players left that are really doing good work and they're discovering new things. And I think it's a new paradigm for psychiatry. I taught medical students for about 10 years um, at Purdue. And when I would go in, it was a small class because they had many of these small classes all around the state and they would go for the second two years to a medical center. But the first two years, they got coursework. And then I would ask these classes of 15 or 16 students, I'd say, you know, what are your majors going to be? You know, somebody would say obstetrics and somebody else would say something else and somebody else would say, ger you know, geriatric medicine. And nobody ever said psychiatry. And I said, doesn't anybody want to be a psychiatrist? And they, oh, no, 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 we don't want to be a psychiatrist. Why? Because that's what I was interested in. Oh, you can't do anything. Psychiatry doesn't have any new drugs. They can't do anything. So psychiatry is one of the most conservative branches of medicine. So this has rejuvenated psychiatry. Um, and not just psychiatry, but clinical psychology as well. There's going to be a confluence of improvements in psychiatry. Psychi a lot of psychiatrists have never had any teaching at all about psychedelics. So yeah, when I was in medical school, they never talk, talked about psychedelics. That's all changing. So we're adding a new dimension to the treatment of mental health in the United States, and globally, actually. How do you see what are the main challenges of uh, making psychedelics a part of the mainstream mental health care system? mostly just time and money. The governments are not funding any of these now. Um, stockholders are investing in these new small companies to see what they can do. It's going to take larger studies. It's going to take more investment, uh, better clinical trials. It's this whole psychedelic science, psychedelic science is, a new, is a new paradigm. And it's like any new thing. Uh, when you discover a new class of drugs, you don't know what, can, what it can do what other drugs can do the same thing. And there's a lot of money that goes into that, a lot of investment, a lot of research. And we just kind of have to wait for the dust to settle. I'm convinced though that, you know, by mining this vein, so to speak, there'll be some gold nuggets that'll come out of it that are going to revolutionize psychiatry. Many people are concerned that the big money is coming into this field and it will change or distort uh, the, the study of psychedelics. What do you think about this? You know, the cost of a clinical trial is tens of millions of dollars. And um, it's just going to take money. And so far, you know, I started the Hefter Institute. It was we, we raised $10 million, which over a period of 25 years, we gave small amounts of money to investigators to get involved in the field, et cetera. $10 million might fund one clinical trial nowadays. It just takes, it takes hundreds of millions of dollars. And where does that money come from? You know, right now there are philanthropists, most of whom have had experiences with psychedelics, and so they think this is important. Or there are some who are opportunists to think, hey, this is the next, this is the next Apple computer or the next IBM, and so they're investing. But um, it, it's going to cost a lot to get these things developed and scaled. I think it'll come. It's just going to take time and money. So you know, there's just going to be money in it. I don't know how you can do it without money.